I'm Tash, for those of you who don't know me. entrepreneur for the last 20 years. During that time, I've worked mainly on businesses that are based in media, e-commerce and retail. I've sold three businesses during that period and that's been really good. <laughs> I don't want to say that. I think for me, being an entrepreneur has always been about controlling my time and flexibility actually, especially as a mother. It's not necessarily been about how can I be a billionaire? How can I drive loads of fast cars? How can I live in a mansion? It's been about, okay, I know I'm ambitious and I'm driven, but I also want to have children. So how can I take control of this so that I can still keep a high income and still create value by building businesses that I can sell? But also, how can I keep control of my time, you know, not be employed and not be trying to juggle work and motherhood in almost impossible circumstances? When I see everybody on the internet, mainly guys doing that, I think that's a typical male thing. For me, it's about flexibility and having the time and control to be with my children. But there's been many times where I haven't achieved that. I think in life, whether you're an entrepreneur or self-employed, there's times where you get that balance that women talk about all the time, right and wrong. But I've always tried to have a few simple rules, like just always stay within a radius of, say, a mile of my children, particularly when they were younger. And being an entrepreneur always enabled me to do that. I used to have my house, the kids' nursery and the office. And the main thing was that I never left that mile radius because that meant I could work hard, but I was always really close to the kids in case anything happens, which invariably it does with small children. You have to be able to get to them fast. So when you get that awful call from the nursery, it was like I wouldn't have been able to bear it if I'd had to travel for an hour to get back to the nursery. So that was my primary drive, which I think is quite different to a lot of entrepreneurs on social media who are talking about their primary drive that is riches, fast cars. I've done really well, but that's not my goal. When I started the businesses before motherhood, I was working at the Daily Mail, which was the only corporate environment I've ever really worked in. Anyone who's on a daily newspaper knows that's a pretty hard place to work. I loved it. I really loved it. And I often talk about it to you guys, right? But I used to look around and think, I know I want children, but I know I'm not going to be able to be in this job and have children. Because also this was a different era as well. This was 15 years ago and the rules around flexible working and things were quite different. On a national newspaper, you often get sent places that day and you just have to go. I used to look around and think, I'm going to have to leave and get myself set up in a working environment which will enable children before that happens. But I was still ambitious. You don't lose your ambition just because as a woman, you're going to have children. So my primary goal was I'm going to create an environment in which I can still be ambitious and but also it will fit around the children, enable me to always stay close to them and enable me to be in control of my time. Ironically, nobody used the word entrepreneur back then. It must have been a word in the vocabulary, in the dictionary, but entrepreneurship was not a word in mass market use. I started my very first business, Talk to the Press, which I ended up selling about six years later, which was incredible. And I would never have thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I remember it started to come into the sort of more wide stream vocabulary and people would say to me, oh, you're very entrepreneurial or you're an entrepreneur. And I used to think, God, what do they mean? And then James Kahn, who was at the time on Dragon's Den, launched an organization called the Entrepreneur's Business Academy. And I thought, everyone's saying I'm entrepreneurial. James Kahn's got this Entrepreneur's Business Academy. I'm going to apply to the Entrepreneur's Business Academy, which I then got in. And it was there that I learned Firstly, the vocabulary around business and entrepreneurship was becoming much more widespread, but there I learned a, a lot of the basic fundamentals and principles of business to realise that firstly, yes, I was an entrepreneur. Secondly, that I needed to, if I was creating a business, I should ensure it was an asset that I could sell, which really led to me turning talk to the press into an asset that I could sell. And thirdly, it taught a lot of the fundamentals of business, which were things that I was doing naturally as a lot of entrepreneurs did. And I didn't have the vocabulary around to understand that I was running finance functions and this functions. And I really learned all of that through James Kahn actually during that period of being in his kind of school for a year. I think entrepreneurship today is snorified, right? It's a career path. It's a thing people grow up knowing wanting to be entrepreneurs. For many years, people didn't do that. They just instinctively and naturally got on with things. And some people might have had that vocabulary, others didn't. 
a load of people just figured it out as they went along. Just through things like common sense, just thinking, I'm going to need this, or need, and just doing, looking around and thinking what's needed and taking the next steps. When I started to get the vocabulary, it definitely helped me articulate more to other people what I was doing. It enabled me to say to other people, actually, I'm starting a business, or I've started a business and it's going really well. And I've realized that in this business, I probably will have an asset that I can sell, which I think another thing I learned from James Kahn, which has turned out in my experience to be true, is that most people don't want to do the same thing forever. So when you start a business, you're very much in love with it and you're obsessed with it and you put your heart and soul into it particularly as it accelerates, so as it takes off, and it, that's quite a hard phase, getting the business off the ground and getting it to a stable place. But after, say, three or four years or five years or whatever, I think for me, it's if I look back at history, it's probably like a six year cycle. Then you're a bit like, I get the gist of this now. I understand this business inside out. It's great, it's stable. But you might not want to continue doing it forever. So you should always try and create an asset in a business that can be sold whether it's for a huge amount of money or a smaller amount of money. That doesn't matter, but that's down to each person, their own individual perspective. But you want to ensure that after all that work, you've created an asset that can be sold. And it's an amazing thing to see a business that you've created go on and continue without you. And all the three businesses I've sold have continued to grow and do well and are all still highly respected businesses in the spaces that they're in. I have a feeling inside me that you could drop me in any part of the world and I'd be able to do something, create a business. I'm not a fussy person. I'd be quite happy if I got dropped in, I don't know where, give me a country. Greece, right. So if you dropped me in Greece, I always think that I'll be okay because I can look at people who stand on the edge of the roads and do car washing and window washing. And I think, God, that's so enterprising. And I'd do that. I'm not fussy, right? If I was dropped in Greece, the simple businesses that you can just start, car washing, windows, flowers, these simple things. And as long as you're not fussy and don't think I'm above this, then you would do it and I'd be perfectly happy. And I can imagine if I go to Greece, have a little flower store next to you, I'd have 10 flower stores and that I'd be perfectly happy. It's a very modern day trend that you have to have these huge, fast growth, runaway success businesses, which is propagated partly by the time we've lived through of the sort of economic boom period, which means there has been a genuine opportunity for some people who do that very fast and very successfully to make a hell of a lot of money. It's also a result of the glamorization of entrepreneurship through social media that people feel that they have to start a business and it has to be a runaway success in 12 months and it has to be worth 50 million pounds or they're a total and utter loser. It's completely preposterous. Most, and the way I look at a business is it goes through a series of stages and all I try and do what I focus on is going to the next stage. It's like a computer game. I'm like going to the next level. You can, to some extent, accelerate that with money and people and resource. But the people still need time. Businesses still need time to just develop and grow and breathe. And I actually, I think what's happened on social media with the popularization of entrepreneurship means that a lot of people have feel they're under huge pressure that they've put upon themselves to grow businesses entirely fast, which is, if they want to do that, for themselves and their own sort of goals in life. That's totally cool, but it's not necessary. And it certainly doesn't mean that a business hasn't succeeded or isn't a success and you're not going to one day be able to sell it. What's been the greatest irony to me about the businesses that I've, I've sold, the three of them, is if I'd known they were going to be saleable assets at the time, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. But you never know that when you're in it. If I'd known that my journey with Talk to the Press was only going to be six years, and I would sell it to Southwest News, one of the biggest and most prestigious news outlets in the country, I would have loved every minute of it. The main business that I sold, you can rank an order of priority of how big an effort was the business, how well known was the business, and how much money did you get for it. So whenever I think back of the business sales, the main ones I think about are Talk to the Press and the Notting Hill Shopping Bag Company. So Talk to the Press for me was my baby, right? It put me in the center of the media. It gave us, it was incredibly interesting. I really lived and breathed it, but I'd also had two children. I'd had no maternity. I was quite worn out. So after it was sold, I felt a loss because it was my identity. I also had a no compete agreement, which meant I had to change industry. So with the sale of that business, I had to leave the industry I was in, which was daily newspapers and tabloid media. That's very common when you're selling a business. 
I just remember like the email stopped. The email stopped. And I kept going to the office by myself. Like a loser. If I still had the lease, I still had the lease. I kept going to the office and I kept trying to help them out. So after I sold Talk to the Press, I had no idea what I was going to do at all, to the extent that all I knew was, I knew a few things. Number one, I had to have faith in myself that I would be able to find something to do that was meaningful and bigger and better than Talk to the Press. And then I had money at this point, so I didn't have to do anything, but that's not really my personality. But the extent to which I didn't know what I was going to do, I went back to college. I went to a college in Notting Hill just like the local community college. And I was a mature student. I had all these friends who were like 18 and 19. And I studied such a random Motley Crew array of courses. I did interior design, video editing and production, website development and website design. And, and all I knew was, I was quite interested in interior design. I thought I could be an interior designer. And I thought, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to have to have video production and video skills. And I'm going to need to be able to build a website because I'm not paying anyone for any website. I needed to develop websites myself because I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up something that I'm going to probably change my mind because I'm a bit lost. You know, actually, you asked how I felt after I sold the business. I felt lost. I felt sad, even though I was obviously happy as well. You know, that phrase, happy, sad, I felt happy, sad. And ironically, Bolt Digital was in some ways the best and the worst business I created because ultimately it wasn't a sellable asset. I've never done six years at somewhere and not been able to sell it. And so to some extent, that's another reason why I made the changes I made because I thought in order to sell this, I would have to do is really beyond what I want to do. I'm Tash Courtney Smith. Follow me for more advice and stories on success, mindset, business and e-commerce and keep shining bright.